G. Homer Durham had a distinguished career in education as well as church service. He received a PhD in political science from the University of California at Los Angeles, and then went on to teach political science at the University of Utah, where he had gone to school as an undergraduate. He was the first head of the university's political science department and later served as the academic vice president of the University of Utah. He went on to be the president of Arizona State University for nine years. After his presidency, he became the first commissioner and executive officer of the Utah system of higher education. And after he retired, he was appointed as a member of the first quorum of the 70, where in 1981, he was called as a member of the presidency of the 70. In 1982, he became the church's 17th historian and recorder, a position he held until his passing in 1985. Elder Durham believed in education and devoted his life to it. He once said, our theology assumes that everyone should be educated to the optimum of their capacity. The word educate is here meant broadly, to include all the means available in the world's cultures, formal or informal. The first Durham lecture was held in BYU in 1987, was given by Elder Neil A. Maxwell. This lecture continues today to honor this great man's life and purpose. We are delighted to have um, Nina McBain speak to us today. I have asked um, our Associate Chair in Political Science, Jessica Priest, to introduce um, Nina, and then we'll turn the time over to her. Nina McBain is the co-founder and CEO of Better Days 2020, which celebrates the 150th anniversary of women voting in Utah, the first women to vote in the modern nation, and the centennial of the 19th Amendment through education, events, and the arts. Nyland's previous marketing experience includes in-house positions in Silicon Valley companies, as well as advertising agencies, including a role in the I'm a Mormon campaign. And she brings her understanding of audience and brand to her current work. Nyland has been an important voice in Latter-day Saint and Utah women's advocacy for nearly a decade. First as the founder of the Mormon Women Project, a nonprofit dedicated to mobilizing Mormon women by telling their stories and exploring opportunities for increasing their voice within the church institution. Nyland's book, Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact, which explores possibilities for increased female participation in, the LD in LDS administration, has been called, quote, a monumental piece of work pivotal, and a remarkable resource that belongs in every Latter-day Saint home. Her work has been anthologized in the Essential Writings of Mormon Feminism and several other compilations. Since co-founding Better Days 2020 two years ago, Nyland has become a leader in speaking and writing about women's leadership and the U.S. suffrage movement, with a specific focus on Utah and the West's early role in that movement. She has developed a team of historians, educators, and marketers that have changed the way Utahns view and understand women's history, leading to shifts in, the, in current perceptions of ourselves and Utahns generally. Her third book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of the West's First Suffrage Triumphs, will be published by Shadow Mountain in February 2020. Nyland is a graduate of Yale University, mother to three daughters, and lives in Salt Lake City. Please give her a warm welcome. to be with you here today. Uh, this is a very special week for us as Utahns and for Better Days 2020, and as I tell you some stories here today, I hope you'll realize why this week, February 12th, 13th, and 14th, are so critical and why it's such an honor for me to be able to speak to a group like this at this time. Did you know that Utah women were the first to vote under an equal suffrage law in the United States. Who knew that? Good. You've all been paying attention to your political science professors and maybe the events you've had on campus, or maybe you grew up in homes where this story was already told. But I hope to tell you some stories today that you haven't heard before to magnify that fact into what was a whole movement of Utah women leading the nation and I'd like for you to think about, as I'm telling you these stories, 
how this impacts you and your perception as somebody who's currently living in Utah, somebody who might have grown up in Utah, somebody who might come back and raise a family in Utah someday. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact that these stories have on you at the very end of my presentation. But in the meantime, I'd like to tell you a little bit, we'll get back to all of these facts. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Better Days 2020. Uh, as Professor Priest mentioned, I started this nonprofit about two, two and a half years ago when I recognized that there were some important synchronicities between Utah women's history and national women's history this year. We decided that these stories needed to be told because knowing where we come from as a community shapes the way we act and feel about ourselves in the present. Because advocating and supporting women is in our cultural DNA as Utahns. It is a legacy we can honor better in the future. And because great things happen in Utah, we can put out a different narrative to the national media about women in Utah. So ask yourself if we're accomplishing these missions um, through the telling of these stories. Hopefully we are. We have a massive educational program that really culminated yesterday with 2,500 school children at the Utah State Capitol building interacting with art and events and uh, artists and activities. It was an absolutely magnificent day. So this year, 2020, is significant for a number of reasons. And what I'm going to do in my presentation here is walk you through this history briefly and quickly. It's complicated, it's rich, it's long, but I'm going to try and pack it in to 20 or 30 minutes. Again, hopefully sharing with you some things that you haven't really heard before. And then I'm going to try and draw some lessons out of it. What does it mean for us today? How does this history impact you? This year, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of Utah women's first votes. As I mentioned, the first time women voted under an equal suffrage law in the United States. Secondly, we're celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment. That was the suffrage amendment. It was the amendment that was added to the US Constitution to extend voting rights to women across the nation in every state. However, those two things were just markers on a very extended process of determining who in this country is a citizen who can exercise their full set of rights. And that process continued for many decades and is still continuing today for people of color and marginalized groups specifically. And so it's important to recognize that in 1965, there were several pieces of legislation in the following decades after the 19th Amendment, but we're also this year celebrating the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so, 150 years ago, yesterday, February 12, 1870, the Utah Territorial Legislature, out in this backwater desert of the territory of Utah, decided to give Utah women the right to vote. Two days later, on February 14, 1870, tomorrow, Sarah Young, Brigham Young's grandniece, a 23-year-old school teacher, went to the polls on her way to work and cast the first ballot under an equal suffrage law in the modern nation. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about why this happened, but first of all, let me talk about what this means when I say the first ballot cast under an equal suffrage law. There's some caveats to that. We have to say it that way because, for instance, the colony of New Jersey in the 18th century allowed property-owning women to cast ballots for a period of time. Uh, additionally, women in places like Kansas were allowed to vote for school board elections. So, elected bodies that particularly had to do with children were considered appropriate for the female domain. But generally, women were not in the United States allowed to participate civically. And in 1848, a group of women congregated in Seneca Falls, New York, a little bit of as, as an offshoot of their movement in the, uh, their involvement in the abolition movement. And they decided that they wanted to write a declaration of sentiments, requesting equal opportunities in education, employment, property rights, child custody, etc. 
the opportunity to vote was a little bit of an afterthought. It was the most controversial element of that particular meeting. But it became the center of what we now know as the suffrage movement because it evolved into this blunt hammer that the women saw as a tool to enact legislation to accomplish the rest of their goals. And so in Seneca Falls, New York in, the, in 1848, we have what was later deemed the official start of the women's suffrage movement. It would end up being one of the longest social justice campaigns in the history of America, officially you know, ending that particular portion, as I mentioned, it, it ha didn't end it, but ending that particular portion of granting women the right to vote in 1920. So from 1848 to 1920. Again, Sarah Young Castor first voted in 1870. So the movement had already been fomenting for, for a couple decades. And the, and the leaders in the East were frustrated that they weren't getting more traction in their Eastern established states. And so this idea came up to enfranchise women in Utah. Uh oh. Why? I'll have to move along more quickly, apparently. Why? You, oh, I'll just show you this picture. This is a picture of the Council Hall building. The building that Sarah Young voted in still stands. It's been moved from its downtown location to, um, to a location directly across from the Utah State Capitol building. And you can see it here, and I will just say that before Better Days 2020 came along, there was no indication this, this historic event had happened in this building. And fortunately, now the Office of Utah Office of Tourism has its offices here, and they've done a wonderful exhibit right in the lobby now to commemorate Sarah Young's first vote and several of the women that I'm talking about today. So why, in 1870, did this strange thing happen in Utah? As you may have suspected, voting rights for women in Utah and civic participation in Utah was inextricably linked to the practice of polygamy here by, of course, the population that was predominantly LDS. Nobody on the East could understand what was going on in Utah, this seemingly oppressive system that was enslaving women, what was going on in this place that repeatedly was asking to become a state, a part of the larger United States. Well, as long as this barbaric and anti-Victorian, anti-traditional system was in place, there was no way that Utah was going to be embraced by the larger nation. So, in 1869, after some debate in Congress, the New York Times suggested, why don't you let these oppressed women vote? Because they will use their vote, they will use their voice, to vote out polygamous leaders and free themselves. And if it doesn't work, only the Mormons will suffer. <laughs> so the Utah Territorial Legislature called their bluff. And they said, sure, we'll enfranchise our women. We'll give them the vote. And as I mentioned, they did. And on February 14th, Sarah Young went to the polls. This is a moment to note that Three months before these activities in Utah, Wyoming Territory, our neighbor, had also enfranchised women. That is a different story. I just wrote a book about it. Go buy the book. <laughs> um, but there was a very specific reason for enfranchising the, the women of Utah, right? That was different from what was going on in some of the other Western territories. And Utah women went to the polls twice in 1870 before Wyoming women went to the polls. Pretty soon, it became clear that the Utah women were not going to cooperate. Not only did they not vote out polygamous leaders and rise up with their newfound civic voice against polygamy, they started uh, forming protest, a protest movement called indignation meetings across the state. <laughs> well, now I'm going to have to enter my password, though, so I should have disabled that. There we go. Um, and in the beginning of 1870, as there was all of this conversation about the polygamous women in, in Utah, they actually 
they actually gathered in one of the largest protest movements in American history up until that point. The indignation meetings, according to the census in 1870, involved 30% of the entire territorial population. They rose up in defense of polygamy. They wanted to support their right to practice their religious freedom. Okay, I have some fun political cartoons to show how much the Eastern media hated polygamy. So if we get it back up, we'll see those. <laughs> What happened was a push and pull for the, about the next two decades between the territory of Utah and the federal government. And it became very bitter, so much so that a number of pieces of legislation were passed to criminalize polygamy and therefore disenfranchise uh, the representative, the, the people of the territory. And in fact, they succeeded in that. Ultimately, in 1887, the Edmunds Tucker Act disenfranchised all polygamous men and all women polygamous, monogamous, Mormon, non-Mormon, in Utah Territory. So while the vote had come really easily to the women of Utah in 1870, they had spent 17 years voting. There we go. Thank you. They had spent 17 years voting, and now they had to fight for it. And so they started organizing suffrage association. There we go. Okay. I'm not a I don't know if you can see that here, but we'll just, I'll just quickly go through, we'll just, yeah. It's not, but that's okay. I'll just, I'll just have to stick over here, stay over here for a little bit more. They organized, they finally, they got organized. They organized suffrage associations in 25 uh, of the 27 counties in Utah, and they started, um, they started turning local relief societies, they renamed them, scratching out the name of the Relief Society on the top of their minutes book and renaming them from the Beaver Relief Society to the Beaver Women's Suffrage Association. <laughs> Not only that, they started cultivating their relationships with the key Eastern leaders, and they were very successful. Because even though they were practicing this crazy marital practice, they were voting, they were doing something that nothing, nobody else in the country was doing. And so Susan B. Anthony, right here, and Anna Howard Shaw and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, some of these names you might know as household suffrage leader names, came to Utah on multiple occasions and fostered their relationships with the Utah, with the Utah suffragists. They were one strand of national suffrage leaders. There was another strand of national suffrage leaders that wouldn't have anything to do with the Mormon polygamists. But Susan B. Anthony despised marriage in any form. And so she thought, that she could sort of plug her nose and associate with the Utah Mormons in her desire for a greater cause. And so she really championed the Utah suffragists. In particular, Emmeline B. Wells, who is sort of in profile there, just above her shoulder, who is Utah's leading suffragist. I'll talk about more about her in a minute. Sarah Kimball, the very stern lady, just right above Susan B. Anthony, you probably know as one of the founding members of the Novel Relief Society. She's obviously much older here but she was one of the powerhouses of the movement. Um, we have Zina D.H. Young, for instance, right there. We have Martha Hughes Cannon, who I'm gonna talk about a little bit later as well, over here. So this, this particular uh, photo shows the, the relationship between the Utah leaders and these national leaders. In fact, the relationship with Susan B. Anthony was so close that uh, on her 80th birthday, the women of Utah who had a very thriving silk business, that's a fascinating story if you want to learn more about that, they gave Susan a bolt of black Utah silk for her 80th birthday, and she made it into a dress that now sits in her bedroom in the Susan B. Anthony Hallman Museum in Rochester, New York. And the reason it has that, that prominent place is because Susan B. Anthony declared it her favorite piece of clothing because it was made by women. <laughs> My personal hero, uh, I'll just mention before we go, these are some of the trading cards that we've created at Better Days 2020. We've illustrated 50 Utah women's advocates. Um, Susan B. Anthony is a friend of Utah, so she got a, a, an illustration as well. And these are the illustrations that are on the fourth floor of the Utah State Capitol building this whole year uh, as an exhibit. 
So I'll mention in, the, in this picture we have her speaking in the tabernacle, which she did on many occasions, and then the gold ring, which she bequeathed Emmeline B. Wells on her deathbed as a symbol of their 30-year friendship and her admiration for the women of Utah. Emmeline B. Wells, my personal hero. Utah's leading suffragist edited one of the longest-running suffrage newspapers in the entire country. It officially was the organ of the Relief Society, but it expanded its mission much farther, beyond just the borders of church membership. Um, you can see it's in, on its masthead. It says the rights of women of Zion and the rights of women of all nations. And in her thousands of editorials, Emmeline <coughs> advocated for not just women in the church, not just women in Utah, but women in the entire nation, and eventually women in the, in the world, as she traveled to London to participate in that movement as well. I'll just give you a minute to read some of these quotes from Emmeline's um, editorials as she was working towards <coughs> Utah and national suffrage. One of the things that we notice as we come across this language and the language of our leaders, our church leaders, from this particular time is how really so. Some of, this, some of these phrases and some of this language sticks out to us as so modern. And these are some things that we still wrestle with as a people and a culture today. So, there was a massive organization in Utah between 1887, when they had all of their rights taken away, and 1895, when they were finally granted the opportunity to become a state. This is the city and county building in downtown Salt Lake City. And in this building, 107 men, because of course the women were no longer enfranchised, it had to be all men, came together. These are secretaries, by the way, so don't get any ideas down there. <laughs> um, 107 men came together with the approval of the federal government, who had said, yes, you can put together a proposed constitution for your new state and then have your people vote on it. So once again, the women of Utah were dependent on men to grant them the right to vote. There was a bitter argument in this constitutional convention over whether they should include women's suffrage in the Utah State Constitution. This is a problem. Utah women had boasted for decades about being able to vote. Even when they had had, had the vote revoked, they were still part of the national suffrage movement. They were still going to Washington, D.C. to testify to Congress that if you give women the right to vote, they're not going to abandon their husbands. They're not going to become masculinized. They're not, their children aren't going to start wandering the streets. These were all the fears of what would happen if women were able to, to participate in civic life. And the Utah women you know, had done this for decades and were being held up on the national stage. This was going to be a big problem if they did not have suffrage included in their state constitution. As a fun side note, B.H. Roberts, who some of you may know from church history prominence, was the leader of the anti-suffrage coalition. <laughs> and to be fair, B.H. Roberts didn't say they shouldn't vote at all. He just wanted what something called separate submission. He wanted them to get statehood and then remember the ladies. Uh, but Susan B. Anthony had specifically said to Emmeline Wells, if, if man appears in your constitution, it will take a hundred years to get it out. And so the women mobilized and they did some amazing and fun things to get the men on their side. And eventually, the Utah State Constitution included Article 4, Section 1. The rights of citizens of the state of Utah to vote and hold office shall not be denied on account of sex. Both male and female citizens of this state shall enjoy equally all civil, political, and religious rights and privileges. That statement has been in the Utah State Constitution since 1896. We are all living under that statute right now. The 1896 statehood Oh, by the way, the H. Roberts lost. <laughs> the Constitution was voted on, people passed it. What it also did was allow women to run for office. And so in 1896, in the first election open to women, 
Martha Hughes Cannon, a doctor with four medical degrees from Eastern Colleges. She had been running the Deseret Hospital, an all-woman hospital. She decided to run for the first state senate in Utah history. She ran against Emmeline B. Wells, her mentor, <laughs> and Angus Cannon, her husband. <laughs> Guess who won? <laughs> she, Martha has an amazing story. She was the fourth wife of Angus, and uh, if you know your polygamy history, you know that the manifesto came out in 1891, officially on paper saying that the Mormons were no longer practicing polygamy. However, if you were a second, third, and fourth wife, and if you had children, what happened to you? You were disavowed by your husband. You had to go into exile. Martha had gone to England, back to her home country, actually to her home country. Well, she had gone to England, but she's from Wales. She'd gone to England in exile. Many, many women went to Mexico. You may be familiar with that history. Men were rounded up and thrown into jail. Children were declared bastards. It was a chaotic time. And Martha was right at the center of that. In her, in her time in the, in the Utah legislature, she revolutionized public health. She created the first public health system in, um, that, that has contributed to the way we live here in the West uh, radically, the way, we, the way we handle vaccines, the way we handle sanitation. But her fourth year in the legislature, 1899, she got pregnant. And she had to go into exile again. She had to renounce her post, go into exile, and her career was over. Would that ever have happened to a male legislator? <laughs> I will um, mention that a statue of Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon is going into the U.S. Capitol building in August. And we're very excited to have this amazing woman represent us to the nation. So the women achieve their right to vote here in Utah. Do they stop? fighting for the rights of women of Zion and of the nation. No. Here we have Emmeline B. Wells. She's tiny, she's eccentric, she dresses all in like old lady white. <laughs> and she's standing next to Senator Reed Smoot from Utah. And they are standing with a delegation from the East Coast who again are coming out to see what's going on in Utah, this strange place that has this, that's been more progressive than the whole rest of the nation. And, they sh and our Utah delegation shows the Eastern delegation uh, their support for the National Women's Party and their platform of a constitutional amendment. So up until this point, there's been a state-by-state -state approach. Right? We're going to go by territory by territory, state by state, and maybe we'll get to all 50. Well, by about 1910, everybody got sick of that approach. And there were some influences that came in from England and really revitalized the whole system, the whole effort, and started demanding an, an amendment. So our group here in Utah gets behind this. This is another wonderful photo of Emmeline standing on the stairs of the, of the Utah State Capitol with representatives from the National Women's Party behind her. And you spot in line. It's like, where's Waldo? Here she is right here. <laughs> in 1920, she was 96 years old. She was also the fifth General Relief Society president of the church. And she lived to see the amendment. Susan B. Anthony did not. Most of the other early suffrage leaders that she had befriended and, and, and worked with had died by this point. And so it was really unusual for somebody to be around who had also you know, participated possibly in that first vote. We don't know that Emmeline actually voted in 1870 in Utah. The records of that vote have actually all been lost and we don't have her journals from the time. But it is very likely that she did participate. At the time, in 1870, she was the sixth wife of Daniel Wells, the Salt Lake City mayor. And so, it was very likely that as a leading lady of Salt Lake City, she had participated in at least one of those 1870 votes. So for her to be, you know, participate in 1870, go through that entire Utah history, and then see the suffrage amendment come to pass was pretty remarkable. 
But it wasn't the only thing that Emmeline did. Um, in our illustration of her, we have her editing the woman's exponent, which I mentioned we have. Uh, the council hall behind her as a, as a significant leader of the, of the suffrage movement. We have some birch trees from her eastern Massachusetts home that we, she loved. And then we have some wheat. Um, you may be familiar with the Relief Society's wheat saving project in the 19th century. It resulted in the largest sale of wheat to the U.S. government during World War I. And Emmeline oversaw that from its very beginning. She had been asked by Brigham Young to oversee that. And so in 1919, President Woodrow Wilson came to Utah on his way out west, because we're the crossroads of the west, they would all stop on their way here, out there. And Woodrow Wilson got off the train and went to the Hotel Utah, where this 94-year-old little lady was living in a suite in the Hotel Utah, now the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. And she was the only person that he stopped to visit in Utah. She was the most famous woman in Utah in the nation. But as I mentioned earlier, the 19th Amendment was a post on a continuing conversation that went on for decades after this, the amendment was added to the Constitution. And as we celebrate these things this year, we also want to take note of the fact that there was decades-long fight that, that was still necessary. The Native Americans and the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, Native Americans were not considered citizens. There was still, once this happened, there was still a discussion about whether Indians on reservations were citizens and they had to have separate legislation. Um, Asian immigrants were legally prohibited from becoming citizens and legal barriers were put in some states uh, for African Americans to vote until Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A Better Days 2020, we are focusing on the suffrage anniversaries, but we are very quick to always remind us ourselves that the history of Utah women over the last 150 years is much broader than that particular story. And so I encourage you to also learn about some of these women behind me who were involved in the uh, Indian Citizenship Act, Asian Immigration Act, and the Voting Rights Act right here in Utah. But for the purposes of this discussion, this is the image from this political cartoon that I want you to take away today. This is not, I'm a native born New York City girl. I can tell you that most of us over on the Eastern Seaboard don't think much good happens <laughs> west of the Mississippi, except for maybe the gold rush. But this turns that whole perception on its head. And this is your heritage. This is your, this is, this is the perception that you can claim as Utahns. As we wrap up the story, I'm gonna leave you with this. This is a statement made by one of our great male allies, Franklin Richards, who was also a general authority at the time, or member of 70 at the time. Uh, going head to head with B.H. Roberts, who was also 70 at the time. <laughs> in 1895, he said, equal suffrage will prove to be the brightest and purest ray of Utah's glorious star. It will beckon our sister states and territories upward and onward to the higher plane of civilization and the fuller measure of civil and religious liberty. Was he prophetic? <laughs> or do we have work to do? to have that vision come to pass. So I've given you a really, really quick tour of a complicated and long history with lots of different players. I'm gonna try and pull out a couple of key learnings from this that are relevant to us today. You might be sitting there thinking, like, those people are like so boring, right? That's why we illustrated them, because they're all black and white, they're all white, they're all somber. So what does this have to do with me? Every single woman in this room, and every single man who has a mother who's been an influential part of his life or part of their community or school, or, owes a debt of gratitude to this history and to these women. Because the suffrage movement was never just about voting, as important as that is. The suffrage movement marked 
a transition, a threshold for American women to move from the limited domestic sphere into the public, broader public and civic sphere. Before this, I touched on some of the arguments against suffrage, that women were going to become masculinized, that they were going to abandon their families and homes. Their sphere of influence was the domestic sphere. Sometimes they were pedestalized for that. They were said, oh, my angel mother, she's so much better than everybody else, and we shouldn't sully her in the dirty wasteland of politics. <laughs> but the movement gave women the opportunity, a platform, on which they could educate themselves, on which they could organize, on which they could publish, on which they could speak to mixed audiences, right? A woman couldn't be speaking publicly to a man 150 years ago. So this was the platform on which that massive transition happened. I will, I will mention Elizabeth Taylor here because we're talking about uh, women of color as well. Elizabeth Taylor is an amazing woman that we've, we've dug out from the early suffrage history of Utah. She actually um, was uh, president of the Colored Women's Journalistic Association. I think I have the name slightly wrong, but she ran a newspaper for the African American community here with her husband, actually. She and her husband ran a newspaper here uh, called the Utah Plain Dealer which was an incredibly vital organ for the African American community here in the 19th century and was part of the um, Baptist a &E churches. We have two major churches in Salt Lake that she was really instrumental in helping organize. So this idea of, of the suffrage movement being this platform, I'll just highlight two Utah women who were part of the Silent Sentinels. So, um, you may be familiar with these are the these are the women at the very end of the movement from about 1910 uh, to 1920. You'll see this picture from 1917. Who started using militant tactics that were kind of brought over from the British suffragette movement, um, and they, they actually chained themselves to the White House gates and were silently protesting, and uh, have, have sort of gone down in history for that. And we had two Utah women who you know, went to Washington D.C. and participated in that movement, and that's, it's, that's been really fun to, to find them and to uncover their stories. But, you know, I mean, before, before this movement, this is 1917, this would have been absolutely unheard of for women to express themselves civically like this. Without the right to vote, what are your tools of influence? They used the petition. The petition was probably the tool that they used most often and most effectively. Um, and so this was a really creative way to also find their voice without the opportunity for uh, elected office or, or for uh, official voting opportunities. Secondly, Utah women worked with men to achieve their goals. This was a very unique part of the Utah movement. As I mentioned, this whole story was, it has, has a dimension of sort of us versus them. But it's not men versus women in Utah, as it was in so many other places in the country. It wasn't a power grab or perceived to be a power grab the way it was perceived in, in, in some, other, some other places in the country. This was a Utah or even the church versus the federal government, right? And so a common enemy makes you good allies. And so this was, this was a really important part. I think because the women were members of the church and were balancing not only their, their civic push and pull with the men, but also their religious push and pull with the men, their, their place in the priesthood structure, they were very adept at building allies and working with men, pleasing the men. And there's some very flowery language that was uh, included in letters to the male delegates when they wanted to get them to include suffrage in the Utah State Constitution. So this is something that I think as Utahns in a, in a conservative state, in a community like ours, that we really need to pay attention to. Because this is a part of our legacy that I think is a position of strength for us, that we need to continue um, having be a differentiator for us as we advocate uh, for women's rights here in our community. And lastly, Utah women were neither pawns nor militants. History is complicated. And women, just like men, are multidimensional. They're contradictory. They're not always in agreement. 
We should be suspicious of history that is too tidy, too clean, and we should resist the temptation to paint women as either all good or all bad. And instead, we should take comfort from the fact that working together for the betterment of humanity is always messy, but it is worth it. Two illustrations. Charlotte Bobby Kirby was an early member of the Utah suffrage movement. Her husband uh, started something called the New Movement, the Godbeites, if you're familiar with that. They broke off from Brigham Young very early on. She was his fourth wife, uh, Godby's fourth wife, and so she was cast off, and she went public about her disdain for polygamy. So, she, so by doing that, she ostracized herself from the mainstream Utah suffragists who, of course, as I mentioned, were defending polygamy. And so she was an outcast, um, and she was not part of the main movement, and yet she continued to advocate in her own way, uh, on her own stage, in a very lonely place. Another example, Jenny Froiseth, an Irish woman who landed in Utah, was an ardent suffragist for everybody in the nation except her own home state. Because as long as polygamy existed, she did not feel like her neighbors should have that voice and that privilege. So she was very active on the national stage and really wanted to vote for herself. But she also founded the anti-polygamy standard, did a lot of lobbying from an anti-polygamist point of view, and had this complicated position of being pro-suffrage but anti-polygamy, and therefore anti-suffrage for polygamists. <laughs> what does this mean for us today? When I present this history, as I've been doing for about two years now, The number one question that I get is what happened? And there are no easy answers for that. For that, we would have to go into history of the 20th century, history of the church, and we're not going to do that today. But what I want you to do is ask yourselves, are you living up to the legacy that these women and men left for us? 150, 100 years ago. Joseph F. Smith, who of course became a prophet of the church, was one of those men who was advocating for women and who saw this work as a continuation of the Restoration. And he said some pretty remarkable things. He said, aside from specifically advocating for equal pay, for women's rights in the workplace, for the opportunity for women to <coughs> not be deprived of the avenues or ways of means of breadwinning. Bread he said, it is strange to say that women may be found who seem to glory in their enthralled condition of being limited in their rights, and who caress and fondle the very chains and manacles which fetter and enslave them. Let those who love this helpless, dependent condition and prefer to remain in it, but for conscience and mercy's sake, let them not stand in the way of those of their sisters who would be, and of right ought to be, free. Let them who will not enter into the door of equal rights and impartial suffrage step aside and leave the passage clear to those who desire to enter. I have found in my work over the past 10 years that sometimes we are slow to cast off the shackles of our imprisonment as women <coughs> in Utah and the church. And sometimes I have found that the perception of Utah women, whether you're a native of the state or whether you're just living here temporarily, shape our views of ourselves and limit what we think that we are capable of. Sometimes we feel like we don't have the role models we need to see what we can be. Sometimes we feel like we don't have a supportive community around us that will encourage us and support decisions that are difficult for our neighbors. <clears throat> 
The most important thing from this story to you as people living in Utah today is for you to see that this has already played out. Martha Hughes Cannon got her four degrees because of the support of her community and not in spite of it. And if you are looking for mentors and for encouragement today and you're not finding them in your immediate vicinity and in this present, look to them because they were trailblazers. They cleared this path for us. It might have been a long time ago, but they did it. And you might need to clear away some of the brush to find the trail, but this is our heritage. And you can claim it just as much as you can claim somebody next door. This is the power of this message for all of us here today. It has worked on me over the past couple of years as I have been studying these women and magnifying their tremendous efforts and bringing this story to our public. We have seen Thanks to some of the work of you here at BYU and some of your professors, huge leaps when we tell these stories to school children and then ask them if they think that Sarah or, I was going to say Jessica, I'll say Jessica, can become student body president or should be elected to an office someday. When they see these stories, we see huge leaps in their cognitive ability to imagine that. And so you can own and take these stories for yourself and make that cognitive leap yourself and imagine that for yourself. That is our heritage. Thank you.